All right, welcome back. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us, my name is Julie Kirk Lenzer. Julie Ledzer, and I am the Chief Innovation Officer at the University of Maryland and the Founding Director of the Quantum Startup Foundry. So if uh, we're launching into part two of our company showcase. Again, these companies are at all stages of development. Our first presenters, Molecular Quantum Solutions, unfortunately, they were not able to join us at the last minute, um, but he was able to record his presentation video, via video, which we'll share with you right now. Hi. I'm Mark Jones from Molecular Quantum Solutions, a startup based in Copenhagen, Denmark. And we are software as a service company focusing on quantum chemistry simulations. You probably know that pharma, biotech and chemical companies spend a lot of their revenue back into their R&D pipeline. The pharma domain, for example, spends around 20% of their revenue back into their uh, research and development efforts. And it takes about 12 years for them to go from drug discovery to drug product release. We with MQS have created a quantum chemistry simulation platform, which allows to reduce the experimental effort. With high throughput screening, we can now solve hundreds of thousands of molecules way faster than any automated lab could ever do. And then when you have figured out which are the most promising molecules, you then go into the laboratory to do the experiments. Our software tool combines uh, the expertise of laboratory technology, since we are chemical engineers and we know how to do those measurements and what kind of properties are the important ones. We have worked since two years on creating this uh, cloud platform for quantum chemistry simulations. This is important because those quantum chemistry models need multi-core systems to be solved and your normal laptop might not be able to solve such kind of molecules which are big in size. And then also at the core of our uh, tool set we have different quantum chemistry models, which can be solved on CPUs, GPUs, and even quantum computers. And we have a dedicated uh, quantum physicist who's only specialized on writing quantum computing algorithms. What differs also us MQS from other startups is that we connect the quantum chemistry models to product process and material design models, meaning we have created a pipeline for different use case applications for industry. And then of course, we combine those different algorithmic steps, of course, with data analysis and machine learning algorithms. Here's the actual case with the pharma company. The laboratory or the pharma company was interested in finding out what is the maximum solubility of the drug compound in a five compound mixture and they had a set of 20 solvents and had to try out and figure out with the experimental setup where can you retrieve the maximum solubility with our tool we could reduce this work which took this uh, company 21 days to two days and this is our value proposition that we can drastically reduce the time and the cost for laboratory experiments. And the market is huge. The preclinical R&D spendings only in the pharma domain are $29.8 billion on the global market and $14.3 billion in the US market and $7.1 billion in Europe. In those two markets, Europe and US, the US, our are our first go-to markets. And we have also compared our algorithm against our two competitors. And you can see here that our predicted value of a solubility of a drug compound ibuprofen in water at 25 degrees Celsius is closest to the experimental value. Further, we've tailored our algorithm that we can retrieve the confidence bounds on those 
predictions. This is important to do a proper risk assessment. And our two competitors don't include any uncertainty analysis on their predictions. Our software runs in the cloud, as said, and we offer it at a flexible license price because we can turn off and on different use case applications based on what the customer is interested in. And when we compare our tool to our competitors, you can see that we have the property prediction layer, which we feed into our digital twin layer. We allow the researchers to do design of experiments of the lab work after having run the simulations. And then we have a hybrid cloud setup, which also allows to connect to quantum computers. And then of course we have some management tools which allow us to handle all those different simulations and to see where you save money while doing those simulations and when you should go into the laboratory. And our business model is divided in the following. We have a dashboard application. We have an application programming interface. We have the different algorithms and use case applications in form of compiled packages, which we can sell individually. And we offer DevOps services, workshops, and consulting. And we've already so sold uh, a DevOps contract or Dev our DevOps service to uh, a university. And several pharma companies have uh, shown interest in our quantum computing workshop. While we are now delivering uh, our compiled packages with the different use case applications to different customers. We've seen that customers are not ready yet to use the application programming interface uh, as we have imagined. So we see an onboarding process where we first introduce them to our algorithms, they get trained with our algorithms, and then we onboard them out on our API. Or directly on our dashboard based on what they're interested in. So far, we've generated two sales in 2021. And we imagine that we will grow within the next years since we are selling a scalable software product on the cloud marketplaces. We are the co two folk, two co-founders, Lukas and me, have uh, completed our PhD projects in 2019. We saw that we can combine our two PhD projects and we have performed the product development, built the core team and managed to create our minimum viable product. Of course, we have uh, acquired equity-free grants, have generated our first paid customers, but we're still in the phase of finding the perfect product market fit. And we also see already we need to go for VC funding to when we find product market fit, that we have a substantial team which can back up such a complex software and to, of course, support all the customer re re requests we get. We are quite agile team, it grows and uh, goes back to a less, lesser number of people based on the uh, needs we have right now, and of course also funding. But we are two co-founders. I've been a postdoc at the Technical University of Denmark, have a degree in chemical engineering, and Lukas Wyszynski has also a PhD in chemical engineering, while he also focused on quantum chemistry modeling when he was uh, a student in Poland. Kao is our quantum physicist expert who uh, specializes on quantum uh, computing algorithms and we have a strong uh, software development team and other chemical engineers which support us. Our board of, bus of business uh, advisors is pretty strong, but to highlight here, we have Kurt Stockro as our uh, most active uh, advisor too who has been the former CEO of QuantumWise 
which he sold to an American company, US American company called Synopsys. So we have the expertise of an advisor who built a similar software from scratch and sold it with, to a, a large big company. And this quantum wise company was focusing on quantum chemistry simulations for semiconductor materials. We've been through a lot of accelerators. We have academic partners and we have, of course, also industrial collaboration ongoing. So far, we secured around a quarter of a million dollars in national grants and prizes. We're still going for equity free uh, funding within the year uh, 2022, but are already going into negotiations with VCs to raise uh, an approximately uh, amount of six million dollars in the year 22 or 23. Since we also declared the US as our uh, entry market with our product, we are looking for commercial collaboration partners in the US. Also, we are actively seeking for advisors and US sales representatives. And then it would be nice and we hope, or I hope that I can next time come to College Park to set up the foundation of maybe having a good basis in College Park in Copenhagen, where we can maybe build our second office up in the US. If you want to hear more from uh, Molecular Quantum Solutions, then please just uh, write an email to contact at MQSDK or visit our uh, web page where you can also find at the bottom our LinkedIn page on the web page and the newest web page will be launched. Thank you for your attention. Hello. Good. Fantastic. So uh, I'm very happy to be here today at Maryland. My name is Sela. I'm uh, CEO of Envision, a company based in Germany. Um, may I see my presentation? can speak with that one. That's not mine. Yeah, good. Fantastic. So Envision is leveraging quantum for a different purpose than quantum computing. And usually when I present this presentation in healthcare conferences, people are like, you know, can't get their head wrapped around this. And here I'm very happy to be presenting this in the quantum computing, uh, mostly quantum computing uh, conference, because it makes me feel like what we're developing is, is as simple as a uh, dating app or something compared to what the others are doing here. So it's, it's always nice to be on the, uh, on the less complicated things, side of things. Uh, so what exactly do we do? We are using quantum to create a new generation of MRI agents. Sorry. I'm also colorblind, so the green and red here are difficult for me to see. Uh, good. So I think there is a wide consensus that lots of unmet needs remain in, in cancer diagnostics, cancer treatment. Just a few examples that we are working on at, at Envision is uh, along the themes of late diagnosis, the fact that people with, uh, with uh, pancreatic cancer, when they get diagnosed, they have less than five months of, of, of life to live. The fact that two million men are still going through uh, 12 bricks, you know, 12 bricks of, of a 12 gauge needle uh, in the prostate to get, to get diagnosed today. The over-treatment in rectal cancer, the delayed feedback uh, that is now uh, basically when you're getting treatment in oncology, you wait months before you know whether treatment is working or not. And all these really important uh, unmet needs uh, are, are, are out there. And one of, the, one of the biggest drivers for these unmet needs is the fact that imaging, which is the most widely used, the hallmark of non-invasive diagnostics, is not solving for it. And we really are focused on the areas where MRI is the modality of choice. And I think one of the biggest challenges of MRI is despite the fact that it gives an excellent anatomic image, as you can see here, like the very high detail, very high SNR, it doesn't give us 
the level of information that clinicians need today when they're looking at, for example, here in, in tumors. For example, we see here there is some tumor, there's something there on the right hand, on the right hand side. It's, it's enhanced by contrast, by the standard contrast material, gadolinium, but is it a tumor? Is it aggressive or not? How aggressive it is? Will it, rea will it react to treatment? If it reacts to the treatment, is it still gone or is it back? All this information is not, it's not easily available today or not at all available today using, using standard imaging. And we're really focused on MRI because MRI are, are, are sensitive to the magnetic properties of, of material. And the material that we have most in our body is naturally water. And that's the, basically the only material that crosses the, the signal-to-noise ratio threshold of, of MRIs. So MRIs are, are a fantastic modality in, 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 understand, in getting the, the magnetic signal from a material, but because they're lacking that sensitivity, they can only detect water and basically create, visualize the anatomical image based on the presence of water. But they cannot detect any other molecule in our bodies, especially not metabolites, which are the key to understanding cancer. And that's what we're trying to do. We're basically addressing that, that threshold of, of MRIs by trying to enhance the signal of metabolites. So what we will be doing is we'll be placing quantum polarizers, quantum enhancers in MRI labs, in T1 MRI labs, just next to the MRIs you can see over there. You can see uh, our, our rendered uh, quantum polarizer there on the left. And what this polarizer will do, it's basically will take metabolites, which are natural to the body, that the body uses grams of these. They're synthesized off the shelf, bought, and then we will use our polarizer to enhance the signal of, of these metabolites, enhancing their signal to the MRI of more, more than 100,000 times before injecting them to, to patients. And it's all based on quantum, right? Because at the end of the day, quantum is about manipulating with quantum particles. And we're using, uh, to, be, to put it simply, a five qubit system in order to polarize these materials and making their nuclear spins, which are usually random, orient them in a single direction. And by just orienting 20% of the molecules in a, in a solution in a, in a specific direction, we are enhancing the signal in over 100,000 times. So you can think about it as if we're making MRIs 100,000 times better, but we're not addressing this with the MRIs. We're actually addressing this with the materials that we're injecting to, to patients. And what does it do, right? Once you impart that spin to the molecule, you inject the molecule, then this molecule is, is, is going into where it's supposed to go in the body. And tumors, which are very hypermetabolic, they take a lot of energy, light up, basically. So on the left-hand side, you can see an MRI image without the hyperpolarized material, without the enhanced material. And on the right-hand side, the enhanced material as it's absorbed by, by, by tumors. And not only, not only that you're getting the yes-no question, is there a tumor or not, but using the spectral capabilities of the MRI, you can also understand how aggressive the tumors are because that's what's so special about MRIs. They're actually a spectral modality that can give you a, a metabolic signature that you can correlate to, the patho to what you know is the pathology of, of different tumors. So not only yes, no, but also how aggressive it is, how much this, it mutated already, how much, what is the level of alteration, of metabolic alteration this tumor is experiencing. And this will I'll go this quickly, but basically there's no other modality right now that will offer that safety profile of using endogenous natural to the body uh, molecules and, and the level of information. We're now having our first prototype that was, uh, was tested at the Technical University of Munich just the end of July. And this prototype is now going into productization. So it's a very interesting phase for us as a company, taking this very cutting edge technology based on quantum and casting this into the traditional frameworks of, of good manufacturing uh, protocols of FDA regulation and, and taking this into, into, the, into the next level. In 2022, we are planning to place such, uh, such quantum-based polarizers with users for animal studies. And in 2023, uh, our collaborators at Sloan Kettering in New York will be using the materials to inject them to, uh, to humans. 
further down the road, we, are, we see ourselves as a pharma company, pharmaceutical companies with many, many errors in the quiver in terms of the type of molecules that we will be injecting and the type of use cases in oncology and outside of oncology. Basically, there is no one single pathology in our bodies that is not based, that it doesn't have uh, metabolic alterations. And it's starting again with, with tumors, going into Alzheimer's disease, to card cardiac, uh, cardiac pathologies, liver pathologies, and so on. So we really are trying to take this imaging industry by storm and offering the kind of the first breakthrough since I would say PET CTs were introduced 20 years ago. Overall, this would allow earlier detection of pathologies, starting with, again with tumors, non-invasive non -invasive metabolic characterization, as I've mentioned, without making a lot of uh, biopsies redundant, and assessment of treatment efficacy almost in real time. So instead of w waiting for months to see whether treatment is working, based on this metabolic alteration, metabolic changes, subtle metabolic changes, it's easy to understand whether treatment is working almost in day, from day one. Here is a use case from our collaborators at Sloan Kettering that they're, they're working on with us taking prostate cancers, instead of doing the, again, this very archaic, brutal, I would say, almost Neanderthal way of, of diagnosing prostate cancers today by, by biopsies, taking the, making the MRI the only needed modality to complete the biopsy, to complete the diagnosis and the monitoring by mapping the metabolic activity uh, around, around the prostate. Uh, and making a decision whether to operate or not, whether to, uh, whether to treat or not. So basically taking the, making the entire clinical workup by using the MRI image instead of using uh, any, any type of biopsy. What we'll be selling, right? So I think in our case here, the business case is, is, uh, is easier than quantum computing, which is very, very long term. We know exactly what we'll be selling. We know who to, we're going to be selling this to. First of all, there's the one-off, the quantum polarizer that needs to, needs to be uh, uh, placed in the hospital MRI site because of the fast relaxation of the material. And then the consumables re required for the polarization process, which is, a, uh, which is a sterile kit that will be provided to, to the users. We're starting with the advanced research labs. As I mentioned, our collaborator, I'll show you a list of our collaborators in, in a second. Uh, and then going into the reimbursable market, the FDA-approved labeled application. Again, very interesting times for us, but translating this such technology into that, into that industry. Uh, this is the pot of gold slide, right? It's clearly, it's, you know, healthcare is a huge, is a huge uh, uh, market, and all we need is one killer application to make this into a big business. This is our founding team, a, co a collaboration between quantum physicists from Germany and Israel, and, uh, and my CTO, Eli Schwartz, and myself coming from uh, McKinsey and, um, and from the tech industry. This is our team. Now, 40 people. This is from 2019, where you could still fit everyone to one frame without social distancing. It's a very multidisciplinary team coming from 10, uh, 10 different countries, chemists, physicists, material scientists, engineers, of course and think overall a great company to work for. We're based in Ulm, Germany. This is the highest cathedral in the world. Uh, our, uh, our investors, Playground Global, they just seed investing in, in Psy Quantum, for those who don't know you, know them, uh, and, and other very strong investors from Israel and from Germany. We've won several public funding schemes, very competitive ones in Europe from the state level in Germany to the quantum flagship in the European Commission, where we've won two grants. Uh, our collaborators, those who complement us with what we don't have the expertise with, right? So definitely all the clinical collaborators from Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York to Stanford Medical School, ETH in Zurich, to TUM in Munich, all of them very tier one centers who will be supporting us in the, in the translation of the technology to, to, use, to human use. Siemens Lothoniers, uh, the biggest manufacturer of MRI, uh, we, just have, we just signed a contract with them to, uh, to, to mutually develop the technologies to ensure that their software suites are supporting uh, the acquisition of the signal as we, as we launch to the market next year. That's it. Tommy, you have to ask for something, right? Uh, so we are here. Uh, basically, we're, we have the runway to go into 2023, but we are um, definitely considering going for a bigger round already next year 
to fund the pivotal study, the, the FDA-labeled study here that we can scope in a very good way, building on existing evidence, building on existing uh, um, use cases that we already have, as I mentioned, the quiver in prostate cancer, bre breast cancer, pancreatic cancer. Um, and this is, a, so far we've raised $25 million, uh, most of it from, uh, from private investors, $17 million, and then another $8 million from non-dilutive from, from the German or the European Commission. Uh, and the goal here is really to take it to the next level, into the pivotal studies, to take the, the imaging and the diagnostic uh, industry by a storm, hopefully. Yeah. Happy to discuss, happy to answer questions, happy to, to explain the quantum aspects of it. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Hi, I'm Rob Hayes, CEO of Atom Computing. Uh, I joined Atom Computing in July, so relatively new to the company and new to the quantum world. Uh, I got involved with the company about a year ago as a member of the board and an advisor. I spent the previous two years as chief strategy officer at Lenovo for their infrastructure solutions group, and I spent 21 years at Intel. The last seven of those, I was the vice president in charge of the Xeon processor product line and roadmaps. Uh, so long history in computing. I have a computer engineering degree from Georgia Tech. Um, Adam Computing was uh, founded by Ben Bloom in late 2018 with uh, Jonathan King in the middle there as the co-founder. Uh, uh, ben came out of University of Colorado Boulder where he did his postdoc work using neutral atoms to build what's the world's most uh, accurate atomic clock. It just won the Breakthrough Prize about three uh, weeks ago uh, that his advisor was the lead on. Um, and then Jonathan King came out of UC Berkeley where he did his postdoc work in chemistry. Um, so together, we're leading a company that is uh, trying to drive the next big paradigm shift in computing, quantum computing, as you guys know. And we see this as really touching every industry vertical and many, many use cases. I think the challenge for us as an industry is to try to figure out what use cases are most beneficial in different stages of the quantum kind of roadmap as we go as an industry, um, starting with, you know, dozens and then hundreds and then eventually thousands and eventually millions of qubits um, and trying to map that out together is very important for us. But we have no doubt that this is gonna be an enormous industry and uh, touch the lives of everybody on, on the planet. And as a hardware computing company, the race for us is crystal clear. It's getting to large scale, scale computation as measured by number of qubits, we're building gate-based machines with error correction. Need to have the right answers, of course. And we got out of the gate really quickly, setting the pace for the industry. So we started building our system in early 2019, and we announced earlier this year our first 100 qubit system, which is up and running in Berkeley today, which is where our headquarters is. It's 100 qubits, so tied for the world's largest gate-based machines, and we've done it with far less resources than any other competitor that's out there. We've raised $20 million to date. A good portion of that is still in the bank. And not only have we got uh, fastest to 100 qubits, but we've got the highest quality qubits as measured by coherence time. Uh, we recently published a paper on Archive, you can see the link there, uh, where we published on all of the qubits in our system, we get at least 40 seconds of coherence time. That's a ridiculously long number of coherence time, and that's really important because you need a long coherence time, which is basically how long the qubits hold their quantum information, in order to have a feedback loop to a classical computer to perform the error correction mid-circuit. And if you have a longer coherence time, you have a longer time to provide error correction. The more capable error correction algorithms you can run and the less sort of interference you're causing on the system. And how we're doing it is we're building, we're the world's first to build nuclear spin qubits uh, out of neutral atoms. It's a very efficient and scalable uh, process. Basically, we use atoms. They're, we don't have to manufacture our qubits. The qubits rest in the nucleus of the atoms. So there's no imperfections because every atom is the same. They have these long coherence times like I talked about. And we control them wirelessly. So we're trapping these atoms in a vacuum chamber using optical tweezers. So we shine an array of laser beams at them at a certain wavelength and the, and the atoms that are in their gaseous form get basically trapped on the beams of light. And then we can shine other beams of light on them to write the quantum information and run the gates. It's very compact. Our system today fits in about 40 microns on a side and we can scale up to millions of microns in less than one millimeter cubed. 
And to give you just an idea what that looks like, so today I, s I have a little GIF here of what our current system looks like where we have a, an array that's larger than 10 by 10 of lasers today. We capture these atoms in these optical tweezers and then we can rearrange them into a very tight uh, grid where we can create entanglement with nearest neighbors. Um, so you can kind of see there how we capture them in kind of a disordered array and then we can just simply move the atoms by, by refocusing the, the laser beams um, so we get that ordered array and then we can run our quantum gates. In order to scale this, we just simply create more spots of light. So we do this in 2D initially, so we can go from like 100 by, or 10 by 10, which is 100 qubits, we could go to 100 by 100, that would be 10,000 qubits. At some point, we'll go to 3D arrays so that we can get to millions of qubits. And again, at the current spacing of the atoms, we could get to those million qubits that you see kind of illustrated in the upper right there uh, in less than a cubic millimeter, all wirelessly controlled. So we don't have to worry about connecting cables, we don't have to worry about putting them in cryogenics. Uh, this system today operates at room temperature. This is what our system looks like today. This is Phoenix, our first 100 qubit system in Berkeley, California. Uh, the qubits sit in the vacuum chambers that you see on the, or in the vacuum chamber that you see on the right. And all the stuff in the middle of that picture there is really the, um, the optical devices that basically break our laser beams, which are standard off the shelf, like one watt lasers. We break them into the array of beams that we can individually control. And, um, and steer them into the vacuum chamber where we create the entanglement and can write the quantum gates. Um, today, those are all hand-placed, really just for maximum flexibility. It's something you'd see like in an academic lab. It allows us to experiment, figure out exactly what we want to go design. Moving forward, everything will be done in CAD. We'll be designing more like optical lattices and engineered um, systems so that we can uh, put the beams exactly where we want them and engineer them for that. And so kind of the ironic thing is, is that system today, which is 100 qubits, scales up to 10, 100,000 X, the size of what it is today, it'll actually get much smaller in the physical size because we'll be engineering it um, to, to be precisely what we want. There's a rack of servers that sits next to this that runs our operating system, compiler, scheduler, APIs, and all the uh, error correction software. We're planning to take this to market. Um, we've already announced it. Uh, we have customers that are waiting to run code on it today, um, and we're starting to open it up to beta testing. Uh, we're also seeking software and cloud service provider partners so that we can align with the ecosystem. Uh, Worley's speech earlier resonated with me and that I think it is going to take a village to really push the industry forward and accelerate all layers of the stack simultaneously. So we are very uh, customer-led and partner-friendly, so we welcome all software vendors, application vendors, and users to come work with us. Uh, next year, we'll be launching our systems as a public cloud service, and we will guide customers to that platform um, and, ha and basically uh, enable all levels of the stack with partners from hardware up to applications. Uh, we are going to be validating the early use cases and the ones that work well. We will then rinse and repeat with other customers to try to get the kind of pump primed for quantum computing. And then in the future, we'll scale those use cases and the customers as we uh, scale up the systems. Uh, we expect broader user adoption in the future, and obviously that's when we can apply you know, sales and, and marketing uh, fuel to the fire in order to grow it. Um, and continue to work with our partner ecosystem to generate demand, serve customers, and those partners include software partners, cloud service prov providers, um, and consultants uh, in order to really drive the market forward. This is our team. Uh, brilliant team, 30, over 30 employees today, over 25 of us are engineers, including myself, uh, 20, over 20 PhDs, hundreds of years experience. It's a very experienced team. Um, we like to hire people from other modalities of quantum and other layers in the stack because they can bring the knowledge that they have from the industry and apply it to our technology, which is great. Um, and we're continuing to grow, and so if anyone's interested in a fantastic career at Atom Computing, please reach out. Um, we are, uh, we've closed our Series A um, and Seed, so we've raised $20 million to date, led by Venrock, Innovation Endeavors, Prelude, and NSF. And uh, if anyone's interested in investing in our Series B, please reach out and we can talk to you about the details. Uh, what we'll be doing with the future proceeds that we get is building our next generation of systems, uh, multiple versions of that, uh, launching and ramping the products as a public cloud service, and hiring staff to execute the roadmap and support the customers. So as you can see, we're a little obsessed with quantum. We are committed to winning the race to large-scale computing with error correction. We were the fastest to build 100 qubits with very good uh, capital efficiency. Uh, we've got the highest quality qubits ever measured 
as measured by uh, coherence time, and we have a very clear and easy path to scaling, simply creating more spots of light with the current architecture that we have. So if you're interested in learning more, please contact me. Here's my information, or you can check out our website. Hello, good evening. My name is Henning Schiel. I'm from Germany. I'm the CEO of Petero GmbH Germany. And since a few weeks, I'm also the CEO of Petero Inc. that I founded with my, with my fantastic US team to establish cybersecurity products on the US market. Um, we have come into quantum because of my previous experience. I was working in my professional life before with and around IBM, and I had the opportunity to go to a lab in Switzerland where one of the first quantum computers ever was built. And I asked all the engineers and the question, and I asked, um, how does this machine work? And everyone was laughing at me and say, we don't know, we're trying to figure that out. So from this moment I was sold a machine that no one can really explain, I love it. Um, so I love quantum computers. Unfortunately, I'm not smart enough to build one. So I'm focusing on my personal experience uh, <clears throat> like on my personal history in cyber and uh, IT and OT security. Um, quantum computers will do fantastic things for us in the future. Uh, you've heard some of these today, and I love the idea that in the future, the next vaccine uh, will be created and developed before a pandemia even arises. Things like this we expect from the quantum computers, and I really like it. It will do a lot of good things. Quantum computers will, on the other side, also be able to break today's breast encryption, uh, especially asymmetric, asymmetric encryption that you use in your browser for your online banking and for your WhatsApp and whatever in your daily life, but it's also protecting today's government secrets, intellectual property, all of this. Well, when will this happen? We don't really know. Can you put up the slides? Oh, thank you. We don't really know when that happens. But it's just a question of time. From our experience uh, with quantum computer companies right now, um, we're still figuring out some details. But actually, to scale quantum computers will be, at a certain point, just an engineering task. So we expect this to happen somewhere within the next two years. And when we started our journey three years ago to develop quantum computer secure cryptography, um, that everyone was laughing at us and said, yeah, it's probably take 10, 15 years. And like one year ago, people got more, we got more attention. And like a few months ago, we were actually approached by the German government say, hey, you are doing this stuff. Can we talk? So um, cybersecurity is actually affected by quantum computers in the future, whenever that will be. And we think that it's time to get prepared to um, be prepared to, to defend yourself, your infrastructure, your networks against quantum computers. Um, we see that the development of quantum computers speeds up rapidly. And uh, there is also another thing about quantum computers or that is going on in cyber today that is called uh, store now decrypt later. We see huge amounts of encrypted data being stored by, you name it, the bad guys to be encrypted later in one, two, five years um, by quantum computers when they are able to break this encryption. So it's usually about long-term relevant data, like for example, intellectual property, patent, uh, healthcare data, healthcare records, you name it. There's a lot of things financial. And these are stored today, and it's time to, to do something actually to protect yourself, your data, against these kind of future attacks. So we're doing this since three years, and we came up <clears throat> with um, this is a small demonstrator, just uh, one of our early prototypes. So we built in quantum computer resistant cryptography that is actually able to defend quantum computer attacks into small chips, silicon if you wish. And <clears throat> these are we are optimizing them so they can run very energy efficient in, in small, tiny chips. So they are able to, to be used in mobile devices, for example, IoT. And it has a lot of applications. And, and this is really a challenge to do that, because quantum computer resistant encryption is 
a little bit more challenging than what we use today. So um, we came up to build this crypto agile core technology. That means we're combining different crypto methods like today's best encryption. We combine it with future post quantum encryption and we mix it basically. So if you want to get hold of any data, you need to break two encryption mechanisms. This is the core technology where crypto agile, that means we're, we can use all the different uh, PQC algorithms available today. And we decided not to wait until the NIST finally uh, standardizes this. We wanted to have this experience right now. So in this chip, for example, we have all the NIST finalists included, and we're actually able to switch between them by the push of a button. Um, so this quantum secure HSM hardware security module, this is basically this. We integrate it in different forms, like the smallest one we have is seven by seven millimeters. We integrate it into mobile devices like smartphones to make them tap proof and also IoT sensors. And we have these quantum secure edge gateways. We have uh, data center grade uh, gateways that are optimized for high throughputs. And we have a cloud instance like software as a service or security as a service model. And um, so all of these contain the core technology including hybrid post quantum encryption. And we have some very fascinating things coming up. So we have a, a quantum key distribution module under development that we want to integrate in our existing gateways. And we also employ an AI defense uh, module to protect against future threats that will probably be based on AI. Um, we didn't want to really be a hardware company, honestly, but now that we put all, these, uh, all our technology in these devices and customers see it, they want to have it, and so <laughs> we are continuing this path for now. I want to see, I want to tell you a little bit about our traction right now. So we're doing a, a pretty big proof of concept with a German healthcare company. Uh, and we are securing their telemedicine workers, their, their remote workers. We are connecting data centers to laboratories and about 150 hospitals. And uh, one of the unique things that we figured out was now that uh, they have an MRI also, of course, and in the future I hope they have yours. Um, so these MRIs are usually, they have a long life cycle or they should have a long life cycle, but they are usually controlled by you know, a, a PC that is actually run, running Windows XP on it. So that is embarrassing, but on the other hand, the manufacturer probably doesn't want to change that. And we put our crypto module in front of that and put an end-to-end -end -end encryption between this MRI and the hospital information system. And by this, we extend the life cycle of this MRI for several years, and saving the customer literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's really fun to do that. Another nice thing is uh, we're engaged in a smart city project in the city of Wolfsburg in Germany um, that has gotten a lot of attention recently from companies like Volkswagen, for example. They are in this city. And what we are doing there is we are putting this line of products uh, from the sensor to the IoT edge to the cloud. So uh, we're putting a unified security architecture in place because in the smart city you have all these different vendors like from the street lights to the whatever you name it. There's a lot of sensors from, from all different vendors. And you, you struggle to bring really a, a, a unified security model into this environment. So right now we're deploying our IoT edge gateways in this environment. And this enables actually the city to shift from basically monitoring different things to actually controlling things. Like imagine you want to just see, you know, you check the weather or local transportation or whatever. All this is not really security critical. But if you want to manage a traffic light and combine it in, with self-driving cars or autonomous cars, that's a completely different thing because people's lives are at risk and you want to, you must have the maximum security that you can possibly have. And that's where we come into play. So we're actually the enabler for this kind of control in the smart city environment. Uh, well, competitive advantage. There's companies out there doing post-quantum cryptography, uh, quite a few, but uh, we're probably the first ones to actually deploy products in the field. And uh, we love this idea to be a kind of an early adopter. And we see like since a few months, 
the companies in the healthcare, especially, they are really fired up and they are ready to go and we are using this momentum right now. Uh, we are vendor agnostic, crypto agile. We use hybrid cryptography right now, but we can switch in the future to PQC only. Uh, all this is built in already and we have a zero day protection module by using two encryption engines. That means you can break one encryption engine, but you're still trapped in one environment. You, you would have to make your way from there to the second instance where we detect it with our AI module. Um, so this is the roadmap. It might seem a little bit crowded, but um, actually the core technology that we developed, we are now putting it into different use cases, into different products that we can, that we can use in the field. And uh, this is challenging, but, but everything based on the same core technology. So we are making very good progress on, on this roadmap. Um, the market that we address, like we heard today, the quantum market is not really defined yet. And we see ourselves, although we are specialized in post-quantum encryption, we see ourselves more like an enabler for the IoT edge market that will be really huge. Uh, an estimate would be 1.5 trillion by 2027. And the security is really the missing link to enable these IoT technologies to be really useful in your daily life by shifting from monitoring to control. And this is what we are about to do. Um, we have an experience management team uh, for in the US. We have uh, a, a team here that built, helps to build up the company. Uh, two of my guys are here today, Robert and Peter, and I'd love to talk to you. Um, we have a team of uh, developers like software engineers and crypto specialists, probably some of the brightest available on the planet. Um, hard to maintain, but this is probably one of our benefits as a startup. We don't have to put in place these standard working schemes. Um, we are asking or we are looking for a five to seven million strategic investment over the next 18 to 24 months. But it's probably more important for us right now at the beginning that we have these products ready to find partners in the industry that are ready to go with us. And this is our, our challenge, like, please, we have it here, we have these products. Um, we invite you to have a proof of concept with us, test our technology, and let's do something together. This is my wish, and thank you for your attention. Have a nice evening, and thank you for your attention. Bye-bye.